Well, good afternoon, everyone. I'm John Chambers. I lead the shallow geohazards and earth observation capability in BGS. And on behalf of my co-presenters, so Steph Bricker and John McKay, who will be introducing themselves shortly, I'd like to welcome you to the second lecture in the BGS series highlighting the importance of geoscience for climate action, of course, in the context of the upcoming COP26 meeting in Glasgow. So today we'll be considering geoscientific perspectives on adaption and hazard mitigation. And we're going to be doing this by presenting three research highlights. So, so three very brief snapshots or examples of the ways in which we at BGS are addressing some of the challenges presented by our changing climate. So the first highlight will consider the issue of groundwater drought. Secondly, we'll be looking uh, specifically at, at hazard mitigation approaches. Uh, related to the increased threat posed by shallow geohazards, uh, such as landslides, in relation to, to climate change. And, and thirdly, we'll consider adaption through the sustainable use of urban subsurface spaces. Now, at the end of the lecture, there, there'll be an opportunity to ask questions uh, using the facility at the bottom of your, your screens. And um, if possible, please address your questions to, to the specific panellists that they, they relate to. So, um, so then I'll, I'll hand over now to, to John McKay uh, to set the context in terms of anticipated impacts of climate change in the UK to the year 2100. And then he'll go on to present the first um, focus topic on groundwater drought. So John, thank you very much, over to you. Thanks, John. Uh, so hello everyone, thanks for joining today. Um, yeah, so my name is John McKay um, and I'm a hydrologist at the BGS. I've worked here for about 10 years now. Um, as a hydrologist, I'm really interested in how water moves around in the environment, particularly in the context of uh, water resources and vulnerability under uh, environmental stresses uh, such as climate change. Um, so that, of course, is going to be the topic uh, of my talk today. I'm going to kick things off just by providing a little bit of context um, on the current climate and projected future changes uh, in climate. So to start off with, this is a, an infographic um, taken from the latest Met Office State of the UK climate report. Uh, and the key take home message from this really is that, is that the UK's climate is changing. The climate is getting warmer, uh, it's getting wetter, and it's also getting sunnier, which I'm sure would be um, a welcome message uh, to a lot of you. So the year 2020 was, it was the eighth sunniest, it was the fifth wettest and the third warmest year on record. Um, and it's actually the first year that all three of those records have been set within, uh, within the same year. But the really interesting analysis comes from, from the work the metaphors have done looking at long-term changes in climate. So they showed by, by looking at all of their, all of the historical climate data they've collected over the years, that between 1991 and 2020, so a 30 year period, the most recent 30 year period, it was 0.3 degrees warmer than 1981 to 2010 and 0.9 degrees warmer than 1961 to 1990. So this is really definitive evidence that the UK's climate is changing and has already uh, been changing. OK, so what about future climate then? Well, the best available data we have currently on Again, another data set provided by good friends at the Met Office. Um, they provide uh, projections of climate change over the 21st century. Uh, they cover a range of emission scenarios, um, ranging from the lowest sort of conservative emission scenarios all the way up to the highest uh, kind of worst case business as usual type emission scenarios that I'm sure you've heard of before. And they also cover a range of scales going from global all the way down to local scale projections. And those local scale ones are really useful, particularly useful for us. Uh, because they provide new insight into climate extremes and how those might change in the future. So just to give you a quick overview, so for temperature, um, not surprisingly, temperatures are projected to rise in the future, um, and, that's, and that's throughout the year, so both winter and summer temperatures projected to increase. And by 2070, we could see summer temperatures rise by as much as 5.4 degrees. Um, but the range here, of course, is, is due, to the, due to the emission scenarios. So we're seeing the low emission scenarios at this end and the high emission scenarios uh, at the top. The hottest summer days are also projected to get hotter. So we're going to see an increase in the intensity of the extremes by 2070, up to a 6.8 degree rise uh, in the hottest summer days. And not only that, but the frequency of hot spells 
So, so um, a kind of higher than average uh, hot weather uh, is also expected to increase. So just to give you a bit of context, for the south of the UK, between 1981 and 2000, we experienced a hot spell about once every four years. By 2070, that's projected to rise by as much as four times per year. So a really big increase in the frequency of these hot spells. For precipitation or, or rainfall, really, um, the, the overall message is wetter winters and drier summers. And you'll see the importance of that um, in the context of the, the talks we'll be giving today. But again, when we focus in on the, ex the extremes, uh, the, ex the most extreme rainfall events are projected to increase in intensity by as much as 25% by, by 2070, so more intense rainfall. And not only that, but that, that intensity increase is going to be seen throughout the winter and the summer. So although there's a projected overall decrease in summer rainfall, the intensity of summer rainfall prevents, uh, events is still expected to increase. Um, this is particularly important in terms of surface, surface water flooding, particularly in urban areas. And then finally, of course, we've got sea level rise. Um, so this is a, a kind of final aspect of climate change that we, that we, that we certainly um, uh, are working with uh, within, uh, within BGS. So this just shows the range of projections for the four capital cities of the UK um, for the end of the 21st century, so by 2100. And again, we've got the lowest emissions in blue and we've got the highest emissions in orange. Um, and you can see there's quite a range of, of projected mean sea level rise, but overall um, there's good consistency across these projections that sea level is going to increase and that has potential uh, implications for coastal areas and coastal infrastructure and cities. Okay, so that was just a quick overview of the, of the UK CP18 projections uh, produced by the Met Office. So now I'm going to go into the bulk of my, of my talk, um, which is around groundwater drought. So just to give you a quick overview, I'm going to start off by trying to answer the question of what is groundwater drought. Um, and then I'm going to focus on these three main uh, uh, sort of research areas that we've been really summarizes the kind of work we've been doing at BGS uh, in recent years around groundwater drought. So we're going to start by looking at the importance of understanding hydrogeology and how that controls spatial and regional variations in groundwater drought severity. We're then going to go on to look at evidence for changes in historical groundwater drought. So we know the climate has been changing. Can we see any evidence that that's, that's actually impacting on groundwater drought severity? And then finally, we're going to be, I'm going to be showing you some uh, uh, a sort of sneak peek at some projections of changes in groundwater drought severity that we've been working on recently. And I've just highlighted some of the key stakeholders and research partners here, and that's really just to emphasize the um they're a really kind of integral part of, of this work so so working alongside other research institutes water companies um, environmental regulators is a really important part of work that we're doing so okay so what is groundwater drought so in its simplest terms, drought is just uh, is simply described as a deficit in water relative to some normal. So of course that begs the question, well, how do you define uh, what that normal is? And for groundwater, our best uh, our best indicator of normal conditions are by looking at groundwater level data, by looking at measurements of groundwater level that we're taking at uh, boreholes in the principal aquifers of the UK. So this is just uh, as an example of 14 different groundwater level time series that we've taken uh, from boreholes uh, within within some of our principal aquifers. And by looking at those, of course, we can look relatively whether groundwater levels are higher or lower than average, and then determine whether or not we are actually in a phase of groundwater drought. Um, and there are a number of methods of doing that. You could just simply define a threshold uh, and say anything uh, above that or below that threshold, we're in a drought. Um, but actually, we've developed a more sophisticated approach here at the BGS. Um, which is a statistical approach that allows us to standardize these groundwater level data into what we term the standardized groundwater index or the SGI. This is a really powerful tool um, because it allows us to take any groundwater level time series and then convert it into this SGI space. And, this, and the SGI has a, a center value of zero. Now zero just means normal conditions, so that defines our normal. And then anything below zero we can define as drought. And by using that, we can then, we can actually extract individual drought events and analyze them. So you can see them all shaded in here, everything below zero. 
And that's really powerful because it lets us firstly analyze changes in drought and drought characteristics over time, but then also analyze them spatially as well. So looking at spatial variations uh, in drought uh, uh, severity. So you'll see that I'm going to really draw on this, this SGI approach quite a lot um, over the next few slides. So this is so this is uh, uh, an image uh, um, uh, taken from a study led by my, actually one of my colleagues, John Bloomfield here at the BGS. Um, and they took a bunch of groundwater level data in Lincolnshire. And you can see all the boreholes uh, here, all of these black dots. Uh, and all of these boreholes are situated in three principal aquifers. So we've got the Lincolnshire limestone here in orange. Uh, we've got the chalk in green. And then we've got the Spilsby sandstone formation in blue. And they applied a cluster analysis to try and group these boreholes into similarly behaving uh, uh, boreholes. So essentially with similar uh, uh, sort of groundwater fluctuation behavior. And this is, this is an image of, of, the, uh, of, of the clustering they did. Uh, and they came up with these six clusters. And you can already start to see some kind of regionalization uh, of, of kind of similarly behaving uh, boreholes. And if we plot the SGI uh, uh, time series of these different clusters, and I'm just going to focus on the three largest clusters, um, we can immediately see just by looking at them and, and by extracting the droughts, which are shaded in here, we can see how different they are. So, so it's, it's, it's so they're clearly coming, they're clearly behaving in different ways. Um, so we've got the the northern uh, limestone in this blue this blue cluster here, uh, which seems to have lots of kind of relatively small drought events. And then if we look at the, the chalk in green uh, or the southern limestone in yellow, they seem to have much larger uh, drought events. And we can actually look at those, those drought characteristics in more detail. So we can look at things like the drought duration, so the length of these, these drought periods, the magnitude of these droughts, which, which we define as the area um, of these um, shaded regions, and then the intensity of the droughts as well, which we define as the minimum SGI. And we can start to characterize the behavior of these different these different regions. So, for example, the the northern limestone uh, cluster up here is characterized by lots of relatively short duration, but relatively high intensity drought events. Whereas in the chalk, it's characterized by more uh, uh, longer duration uh, um, uh, groundwater droughts uh, and some very high magnitude, uh, but lower intensity droughts. So it's these kind of characteristics uh, that are really important uh, to the end users, um, uh, that the actual the actual water users. They they need to know these kind of aspects associated with drought. So what is it that brings to the ground this spatial variability? Well, one of the key explanatory variables uh, in this spatial variation uh, is actually the thickness of the unsaturated zone. So the unsaturated zone um, you can think of as uh, uh, the region below the ground surface uh, extending all the way down approximately to the water table. And what we found is that the thicker the unsaturated zone is, uh, that tends to result in these, these longer duration, uh, more slowly responding groundwater systems. Uh, and you can, you can kind of reason with yourself as to why that might be. If you've got a relatively thick unsaturated zone, it takes much longer for water to percolate through that and get into the groundwater system. So it should, it should result in these kind of longer uh, uh, these, these longer duration events. But the unsaturated zone is also implicitly linked to other characteristics of the, of the hydrogeology. So things like the aquifer permeability, things like the aquifer thickness, um, uh, and also surface topographic uh, groundwater drainage features such as rivers and springs. So this really just highlights that the hydrogeology it has a really important control over spatial variability in, in groundwater drought characteristics. And therefore, if we want to understand regional groundwater drought behavior, we need to understand uh, the hydrogeology as well. Okay, so I showed you uh, towards the start of this talk, uh, um, evidence that, we, that there has been a change in climate uh, over recent years. So what we wanna find out is, has that resulted in any kind of change in, in groundwater drought severity? And if we want to answer that question, what we really need are good, long and continuous time series uh, of groundwater level data. And luckily, uh, in the UK, we've got two of the longest uh, groundwater level time series, um, both situated in the chalk, one of them in the south of England, Chilgrove House borehole, and one of them in the northeast of England, which is Dalton Home borehole. 
and both of them have groundwater level data extending all the way back into the 1800s. So these provide a really valuable source of interchanges in, in groundwater drought behaviour. So this plot here um, appears uh, pretty confusing to start with. Lots and lots of dots, lots of coloured colored dots. Actually, what these are showing, each of these coloured dots corresponds to a month in the historical groundwater level data in which this, this, these groundwater aquifers were in drought. Um, the yellow dots indicate relatively moderate droughts, the orange dots indicate more severe droughts, and then the purple dots indicate the most extreme, the most severe droughts of all. And if we go from left to right along these plots, what well, we're looking at, at different time zones. So we're looking uh, in the first one, we're looking at uh, between 1891 and 1932, and then we extend all the way to the right and we're going between 90. 74 to 2015. So as we go from left to right, we're going from the past up to present day. And you can see the first obvious observation is that the number of these colored dots is increasing as we go from left to right. So the number of drought months is increasing. Um, but what we can also see is the color of these dots is changing. So we can see more of these orange and more of the purple dots uh, than we can see in the past. So not, not only are the number of drought months increasing with time, but the severity of those droughts is also increasing. So this really provides a, a, a clear evidence that drought severity has changed uh, historically. The key question, of course, is why is that? So if we want to answer that, we can look a little bit, a little bit more detail at these plots. Um, and along the x-axis here, we've got, so we haven't plotted the standardized groundwater index, but we've plotted the standardized precipitation index. Um, and essentially anything that's lying on the left-hand side is in precipitation deficit. So if you look at all of these dots, almost all of them appear to be lying on the left-hand side of the plot. And this immediately says to us, uh, uh, precipitation deficit is almost a prerequisite to, uh, to groundwater drought. So you need a precipitation deficit to induce the groundwater drought. So an obvious conclusion for this would be, well, it must be then that it's been getting drier over time. So we've been getting less rainfall and that's why we're getting more droughts and they're getting more severe. Well, that's not the case. If you look at the rainfall records at, at these regions, they ha they ha there's no systematic trend uh, in the rainfall data. However, we do know there has been a systematic trend in temperature. And then now if we look at the y-axis, on the y-axis we're plotting the standardized temperature index. And then if we look to see how, these, uh, how the centroid of these groups of colored dots are changing over time, they're shifting upwards as we go from the past towards the present, and the same down here as well. And, uh, and, and, and what that's suggesting, or what that's showing, is that as the groundwater drought severity has been increasing, the temperature uh, associated with those drought events has also been increasing. Uh, uh, or in summary, the, the increase in drought severity is associated with an increase in temperature. So this suggests that it is the temperature increase that we've experienced in the past that has been driving this increase uh, in, in groundwater drought severity. And the reason for that, we can relate that back to evapotranspiration processes. I won't go into the details of that, but I'm happy to answer questions around that if people uh, want to know. Okay, so we know now that there, there is clear evidence that groundwater drought is sensitive to historic changes in climate. So what does that mean for future changes in groundwater drought severity? Well, that's the question we are now trying to answer. Um, and we're trying to answer it as part of this uh, new or uh, an ongoing project called Enhanced Future Flows in Groundwater. This is a project we're doing in collaboration with UKCEH uh, and HR Wallingford. And the key output from this project is to deliver a nationally consistent set of hydrological projections based on the UK CP18 climate scenarios. Um, so hydrological projections, I mean specifically river flow projections and also groundwater level projections. Um, and of course, at BGS, we're, we're leading on the groundwater side of things. A quick plug here, actually. We, we've, we've now uh, produced uh, these, these, uh, this set of projections, and we're in the process of getting them published online at the NERC Environmental Information Data Center. Um, so please do keep an eye out for them uh, as they will be coming out fairly shortly. So how do we generate these projections? Well. To do that, we're taking the UK CP18 climate data and then we're employing our, uh, our expertise in groundwater modelling. Um, and we're using a groundwater model that we've developed here at the BGS called Acromod. Acromod's a really simple groundwater model. 
and it could simulate ground water level time series uh, at an individual borehole. And we've actually got lots of these models. You can see them here on the right hand side, all of these white dots. We've got them uh, uh, situated all across the principal aquifers of the UK. We're also using another model called Zoodrum, um, which is a groundwater recharge model. So this doesn't simulate groundwater levels, uh, but it simulates the infiltration of water into the subsurface and then percolation to, uh, uh, to the saturated zone, uh, to, to the water table. So that allows us to produce um, nice, pretty images like this, uh, these, these maps of groundwater recharge across, across the UK. Um, and, and so we're, we're also uh, delivering uh, projections of changes uh, in groundwater recharge as well as levels. But just to finish off, I'm going to focus on just giving a, a sneak peek at some of the projections uh, of, of groundwater levels. Um, so we're going to focus in on 50, uh, 50 boreholes uh, across the UK. Uh, and on the right hand side here, um, these are uh, tables uh, that have all of the boreholes listed along, along the left hand side, along the rows. Uh, and then in each column, we've got different drought characteristics, groundwater drought characteristics. So we've got uh, drought duration, drought magnitude, drought intensity, and then the total number of drought months. Now in this table here on the left hand side, we're looking at changes in these different drought characteristics in the near future, which is 2020 to 2049, relative to our recent past. And on the right hand side, it's exactly the same, except this time we're looking at changes in the far future, 2050 to 2079. Now, the key thing you'll notice, they're, they're obviously colour coded and essentially the redder they are, the worse things are getting. And you'll see there's lots of red across these tables. And, and indeed, that that is what we're generally what we're seeing so far is that the overall direction of change is that groundwater drought is projected to get worse. It's projected to get more severe. So longer duration, higher magnitude, higher intensity droughts. However, we are starting to find some really interesting uh, intricacies in these in these results and some of you might have noticed that on, in the far future table at least there's there are some areas of blue there appears to be more blue in the far future than there is in the near future um, and we're still analyzing this and we're still figuring out exactly why this is but at the moment what we think is that this is likely due to uh, the complex interplay between the projected rise in temperature uh, which of course would serve to induce droughts and make drought more severe but also the projected rise in winter rainfall, which would serve to mitigate uh, against drought. So it appears in the far future, at least, we're kind of getting this buffering effect between the two, uh, where they're sort of buffering each other out. And therefore, in some regions, at least, it appears they're likely to show more extreme changes in drought severity uh, in the relatively near future uh, um, uh, compared, to, compared to the far future. So, okay, just to summarize, um, so at the BGS, we've developed uh, a methodology uh, for drought, character drought characterization. So a really powerful tool that allows us to uh, take groundwater level data and extract and analyze them for, for groundwater drought. Um, and using that approach, uh, we've shown the importance of hydrogeology and why we need to understand the hydrogeology and hydrogeological properties to understand uh, drought vulnerability and regional drought uh, vulnerability variations across the UK. We've also shown that um, there's a, a strong association be between historical climate warming and uh, an increase in drought severity. And we're now beginning to show by combining the UK CP18 climate data uh, and our own groundwater modeling expertise, we're starting to show how, how uh, drought severity will change over the 21st century. The current story appears to be that severity is likely to increase, but, and there is a bit of a but, there's still more analysis to do, so please do watch this space. So, um, yes, just to say, please do use the Q&A feature uh, to ask any questions uh, that you may have, I'll be happy to answer them. Uh, but for now, I'm going to pass you on to uh, colleague uh, John Chambers, who's going to uh, talk about shallow geohaz ge uh, geohazards and mitigation uh, in the context of climate change. Ah, oh, super. Thank you. Thank you, John. So then I'm, I'm going to spend uh, a few moments now considering how, how we, we can approach mitigating uh, the increasing threat posed by shallow geohazards in the context of our, our changing climate. I'll be focusing particularly on, on the use of near-surface geophysics uh, to contribute to, to landslide um, 
understanding and early warning. Uh, but, but before I do that, um, I, I want to uh, consider the context in, in which, in which we, are, we are working. So if we consider the UK context, uh, we are, uh, I guess, a very small, uh, very, very um, intensely developed island with uh, considerable infrastructure networks um, and developments. So long linear infrastructure, such as, such as uh, the highways um, and railway networks, uh, lots of buried and, and surface um, uh, infrastructure and pipelines, and of course, the, the built and the urban environment as well, all of which um, can be impacted by shallow geohazard uh, issues. If we take, for example, the, the issue of shrink swell clays that, that can cause very significant ground and, and slope stability problems. Uh, now these shrink swell clays extend across significant areas of the UK. Other problems that we can consider is, is the age of some of our infrastructure. So if we take, for example, the canal and, and the railway networks, significant elements of these networks were, were built, constructed uh, one or even 200 plus years ago, uh, built to no recognizable engineering standards, often using inappropriate materials. And, and of course, these, these assets are deteriorating and degrading uh, due to, to age-related pressures as well as environmental pressures. And if we take into account um, projections um, of climate change impacts, we're, we're looking at rising sea levels, putting very significant pressure on coastal infrastructure, for example. The, the projection of wetter winters and drier summers and the greater intensity of extreme weather events are all pushing, if you like, geohazard issues, particularly around, for example, slope stability in one direction. And, and that really is towards worsening issues uh, as, we, as we go into the future. Now, we're already seeing very substantial problems uh, in relation to, to extreme weather events and, for example, intense rainfall events where, where our infrastructure assets are severely impacted. Now, in terms of very, very clear socio-economic pressures, um, looking at sort of annual uh, uh, costs in the order of hundreds of millions of pounds, and and as I said, likely likely to get significantly worse. So, in terms of the contribution of geosciences to, to, to these sorts of problems, well, a key area there where we do contribute is to, is to observe and to understand these issues. Uh, so, so lots of different approaches that we can bring to bear on these problems. Uh, starting with, if you like, the humble sort of walkover survey, uh, surface observations and mappings, so, so boots, boots on the ground, something that we do, do routinely. The increased use of remote sensing technologies uh, with a variety of platforms, all the way from satellite-based observations, uh, with increasing use also of, of, of nearer ground observations through UAVs, for example allowing potentially really, really significant coverage of the surface and, and very near surface in terms of observing and understanding. Of course, the use of intrusive sampling, so directly interacting with the subsurface, so identifying processes that might give rise to the, the surface expression of failure, which, which can often happen at a much later stage. Um, so instrumentation of, of the, the subsurface, um, including with a whole range of sensors and, and wireless um, sensor networks, for, for example. And then the use of geophysics. So if you like the spatial and volumetric element, so um, joining the dots between intrusive sample points, um, going from surface observations from remote sensing and diving into the subsurface. So, so what we have here is a very complementary set of, of observing techniques that allow us um, to, to get a far better handle and to better model the sort of processes and that, that we're seeing develop in, in terms of um, ground and slope and stability. It enables us to, to develop products to, to inform our stakeholders, you know, for example, Geoshore and Geoclimate, just to, just to name a couple. And then of course, uh, all of these things can, can feed into geohazard mitigation. And I have a list on the screen here of uh, just a few examples of mitigation approaches. And the one that um, I indicated I'm going to focus in on now 
is, is early warning systems, uh, particularly in the context of landslide um, hazard. So what, what do I mean by a landslide and early warning system? Well, Intraria tell um, proposed a scheme which I, I think is, is very broadly applicable. And, and although various approaches have been developed, I, I think the, the elements that they propose, uh, propose are, are really common, common to most other approaches. So we have a design element. So it's, it's designing our monitoring approach, um, our early warning approach, based on knowledge of the problem, you know, to understand the problem that we're seeking to address. Uh, and this, this might include geological and environmental information in terms of the context. And then in terms of the monitoring itself, it's bringing observing capabilities, whether remotely sensed or in situ type monitoring to bear uh, on the problem at hand. And then the forecasting to look at the, the changes that we're observing, physical property changes, changes um, in, in, in conditions to try and anticipate uh, future problems, uh, generally on the basis of thresholds. When we see certain property thresholds being exceeded, indicating the point at which we might anticipate um, slope failure events. And then to, to educate, to communicate, to inform, to, 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 to let those people um, who, who need to make decisions or who are directly impacted um, to, to, to provide them with the information they need in order to, to, uh, to, to plan um, their, their response. Now, these sorts of um, approaches, landslide early warning systems, can, can operate across a range of scales, uh, from regional all the way down to slope scale, and can be as simple as uh, maybe a network of rain gauges um, uh, across an area. Um, but as detailed as a heavily instrumented slope, lots of subsurface sensors. And, and it's the latter um, that I'm going to focus on more for the remainder of the talk. I also want to introduce the, the concept of remote condition monitoring. Now, this is, this is more widely used in, in civil engineering and engineering geology, um, but it has, has a lot in common with, with landslide early warning systems. So remote condition monitoring might be applied on engineered slopes, um, for similar reasons, to try and anticipate deteriorating condition in advance of, of problems happening. Okay, what I want to do now is to introduce a, a geophysical technology that we've developed within BGS, along with a, a range of external um, stakeholders, in the public and private sectors, and, and the technology is called PRIME, Proactive Infrastructure Monitoring and Evaluation System. It's based on a, a geophysical technique called resistivity imaging or electrical resistivity tomography or ERT for short. Now using this approach, we deploy our sensor networks, typically at the ground surface, allowing us to non-invasively image into the ground. So these are permanently or semi-permanently deployed along with our monitoring instrumentation. We control and communicate um, uh, with the system using typically the, the, the mobile phone network 5G, uh, where we can retrieve data and then use an automated processing scheme to, to generate our time-lapse images of the subsurface. Now, the automation, the data processing is really key here. Where you have multiple sites streaming in very large data sets, it's impossible to manually process these data, particularly if you want timely um, response to, to changes uh, at the monitoring site. And then, of course, the delivery of information, in our case, via web dashboard. Uh, to, to stakeholders. Just a few more words about the geophysical technique that we're using, so ERT. Now, now why is resistivity a useful property to look at in this context? Well, first of all, resistivity is sensitive to variations in composition, so we can use it to, to map or image uh, the property variations within the subsurface on the basis of material types. For example, clay conducts electricity really quite well, and so has a low resistivity, whereas um, hard Harder materials, granites and the like, will have a much higher resistivity. They're, they're, they're not able to pass electrical current so, and so, so well. Now, the technique is in, incredibly sensitive to changes in moisture content. So a lot of current flow in the subsurface through the pore fluid. So as we can see from this plot here, as we reduce the, the moisture content here, gravimetric moisture content, as we reduce the moisture content, so resistivity increases. And on that basis, resistivity is widely used um, for hydrogeological problems. And we've also developed a scheme whereby we can detect ground motion um, by looking at the electrical signatures. So our grid of electrodes, as shown here on the right-hand side, 
and effectively also serves as a motion sensing grid. So, so lots of reasons for using this technology um, for, for looking at slope stability problems. And in terms of the innovation here, really the innovation is, is the, the, the production of low cost instrumentation that can be powered using just um, a small solar panel um, with the automated workflow to go with it. So if you like an end-to-end -end monitoring system. Now, how does this, this work in, in terms of our concept of landslide early warning? Well, in, in terms of design, we have to deploy our sensor arrays in conjunction with, with other sensing approaches. One who never uses geophysics in isolation. And um, based on um, our knowledge of the problem, we, we design our uh, installation to address the problem at hand. In terms of the monitoring, we have both the hardware and the software components, both critically important. And then based on our ability to observe the subsurface processes uh, potentially linked to slope failure events, uh, we, we then identify uh, appropriate thresholds um, beyond which to, to take action communicated via um, a web dashboard. So two, two very brief examples of, of, of using this sort of approach. The first on a natural landslide and the next on a engineered slope. So starting with a natural landslide. Here we can see a photograph of the Hollin Hill Landslide Observatory. So this is a, a field laboratory, effectively. BGS has been developing over the last 10 years plus in, um, in partnership with a range of, of other collaborators. It's situated on Lias Group uh, mud rocks. The Lias Group you can see on, on the map here on, on the left-hand side extends across a significant portion of the UK and is associated um, uh, with, with slope failure problems being a very weak mud rock. And at this site, we've, we've deployed all sorts of sensing technologies, piloted all sorts of monitoring approaches that have since been uh, rolled out to other contexts and other, other monitoring problems. So just to look, look a little bit more at the geology of the site, so we have our Whitney Mudstone Formation um, uh, materials at the top of the slope, and it's these materials that are failing, uh, sitting above the more competent staves sandstone formation. So we get rotational failures at the top of the slope as seen in the section and in the aerial LIDAR photo um, um, image, shall I say that, that you can, can see at the bottom right. And then we, we have this development into to earth flows towards the bottom of the slope. You can see some of the geophysical baseline images superimposed um, on these plots and in 3D uh, to the bottom, bottom left. And as I said, lots of other monitoring approaches also being trialled at the site including subsurface and remote sensing type approaches. I want to show you some, some monitoring results from the winter just gone. So we're looking at uh, an aerial photograph drape here based on UAV uh, photogrammetry uh, survey results. Uh, the white trace that you can see are uh, fibre optic cables that we've installed at the site for strain monitoring. And then very shortly, you will see the um, 3D imaging volume for the ERT. And here we can see our baseline ERT image. We can see the, the low resistivity blue colors, of the Whitney mudstone, overriding or overlying the stay sandstone formation shown as the warmer colors dipping into the hill slope. And also the earth flow lobes um, slipping over the stay sandstone here and here. What we're going to see now in, in terms of time-lapse sequence of, of strains within the fibre optic cables, but also ERT-derived moisture content within the volumetric image. So we can see the moisture levels increasing as we move into the winter. And then subsequent to the increased moisture in the back scarp region, we see the development of strains and the, the indication of movement on the fibre optic cable. So compressional at the front of the rotated block and extensional towards the back. So we, we have this cause and effect relationship between the development of um, elevated moisture conditions, albeit very heterogeneous um, conditions in the subsurface leading to uh, the slope failure event. And we're, we're getting to the point with this site where we're able to, to anticipate the movement based on exceeding certain moisture content thresholds. And um, we're, we're developing this, this site in, in terms of better linking the geophysical and geotechnical properties, so indicated resistivity and moisture content, but also looking at the relationships with, with suction, a key parameter, slope stability, and using sort of very rich, spatially and temporally rich uh, geophysical information to, to better inform uh, models of, of slope stability. 
So moving on to the second example, a railway cutting here, where you see a LIDAR scan um, showing 100 meter section of cutting. You see our baseline ERT images here, again, very heterogeneous ground conditions, looking again at weak mud rocks. Now, at the, each end of this section of cutting, we've got heavily wooded areas and then a grassed area in the middle. OK, so very variable vegetation. You can see our monitoring installation uh, there on the, the right hand side. So the, the prime systems are seen in the green box with a small solar panel. The, the monitoring arrays are deployed across this section of cutting that they're, they're buried just below ground level for protection. So if you visited the site, all you would see of the system is, is the monitoring enclosure and solar panel. What we're going to do now is look at a time series data going from late summer in, into winter, uh, showing moisture uh, related changes at the site. So, so a drop in resistivity will, will be seen as the, dry, um, the, the blue cells and then the, the red cells um, represent a drying out. So, so in late summer, we, we still see some drying across the surface. But as we move into winter, we, we see a wetting front develop. We see much greater penetration in the wooded areas where evapotranspiration has effectively stopped. You've, you've got greater ground disturbance through more organic matter and the disturbance of the tree roots. Whereas in the grassed area, much more stable in terms of moisture dynamics. So, so, so potentially very significant for slope stability, where we'd want to minimize this deep cycling of moisture driven processes. And another point of interest at this site is the um, preferential wetting up of, of an area of the toe. It's an area associated with um, drainage, a counterfort drain, which should be taking moisture away from the toe region, again, where, where instability can, can develop. But in this case, it's not. Um, now, none of these things were visible from the ground surface. It's, and, and, and clearly, we're looking at a very heterogeneous sort of system here. This sort of imaging approach can really help to understand if you like, potential asset deterioration processes. And, and I should say that this sort of monitoring approach is, is, is not for and deployment everywhere. It's very much targeted on particularly vulnerable or safety critical areas. So just to summarize, we've looked at a range of multi-scale multi-method observational techniques to help us understand processes driving shallow geohazards in the context of our changing climate. So looking at problems that we anticipate will get significantly worse as we move into the future. And what these sorts of approaches are enabling us to do but to shift more and more towards intelligent, proactive monitoring. So providing, if you like, uh, real world solutions in support of geohazard mitigation. But just to acknowledge um, some of our partners in this, and I particularly flag up the Achilles project led by Stephanie Glendinning at Newcastle University, uh, with a number of other university and stakeholder partners looking at the problem of, of climate impacts on long linear infrastructure. And, and also, of course, our, our our other partners um, working on the problems that I've just highlighted. But I'll stop there and hand over my colleague, uh, Steph Bricker, who will pick up the theme of, of, if you like, the built and urban environment. So thank you, Steph. Thank you very much, John, and good afternoon to everybody. My name is Stephanie Bricker, and I'm a hydrogeologist at the BGS. And for the last few years, I've been leading our urban geoscience research program. And really I'm motivated to think about how we manage the subsurface space in our towns and our cities in a more integrated fashion uh, to look at uh, climate resilience and sustainability and to really think about the data and evidence that people uh, need to, to enable that. Um, we've heard from John Mackay and John Chambers um, about how climate change uh, can impact on our resources. Um, and on our infrastructure and slopes. Um, what I'd like to do now um, is to get us to think about climate change in the context of the urban environment. So I'll just share my slides with you. They should be coming through now. Why is this a problem? Well, three, more than 300 councils um, in the UK have declared a climate emergency. And they've done that because we're under a lot of pressure. We're an urban population. More than 80% of us are living um, in towns and cities or in urban locations. 
Our cities are really important to our economy. So about 60% of our output coming from cities with a particular bias from London. And we know that our urban centers are a big part of the problem. So we're big consumers of energy and big emitters of um, carbon emissions. John Mackay gave us um, a really nice introduction into the types of climate change that we're likely to see. And just to recap that for us, um, so by 2050, there's a 50% chance of having summers as hot as the heat wave we experienced in 2018. So a 50% chance. We've heard um, from John about the, the increase in intensity of summer rainfall events. So we're already getting very heavy um, summer rainfall, and that's likely to get more intense. This is a particular problem within the urban environment because we have a lot of grey cover and hard standing, which means that that rainfall can't infiltrate properly into the ground. It runs off and we get issues with surface water flooding. And of course, we're getting warmer, wetter winters. So again, concerns around flooding. So as an urban geoscientist, I'm thinking, well, what, what role can the ground play? How does the ground help us or can it, can it help us um, in delivering our climate targets? If we look at the um, image on the screen, it's quite a traditional view of, uh, of how we use the space beneath our cities at the moment, whether that's for utilities or for basements, for our transport infrastructure. And my question to you is, is this how we should be using subsurface space for our cities in the future if we are going to see climate neutral cities or our net zero city? I think the answer to that is probably no. So if we take a look at how we could be using and how we're starting to use the subsurface space in our cities, we can see that um, we can use it in a more integrated way to be thinking more about that subsurface space as a connected part of uh, our cities at surface. And within this diagram, we've picked out a few examples, whether that's using uh, space for growing crops um, underground for a more local market, use of data centers, or even the concept of having uh, underground parks linked to green um, infrastructure at surface, or enhancing the use of sustainable drainage systems to encourage infiltration into the ground. And perhaps some more novel um, examples uh, from Kuala Lumpur, there's a multi-use tunnel, which uh, is a road under normal circumstances and under extreme rainfall events helps in terms of flood storage. Or maybe the use of old mine shafts for gravity energy storage. We can see that there's actually lots of ways in which um, that underground space can be used to help reduce the impacts of climate change help us to adapt, and just to think more coherently about that space and efficient use of resource. So I'd say there's lots of reasons to be optimistic, um, but we have to be a bit cautious with that. And as a geologist, we understand that you can't put these interventions in everywhere. Not every solution will work in every town and city. And so in the same way that we characterize our cities at surface, we're concerned with characterizing um, the geological uniqueness of our cities. And what you're seeing on the screen here is the bedrock geology for just a, a snapshot of um, some of the towns and cities in the UK. And what we see is that um, the geology is really variable. Okay, so between the different cities and within the cities, and of course, this is just giving you the overview of the geology at surface, and we know um, that it varies with depth. So a big part of our research program is building up that 3D geological model or ground model so that we can understand those conditions. And what we're really trying to do is to understand the link between um, the geological formations, the properties of, the, of that geological formation, 
how that manifests and therefore what the implications are for how we develop our urban areas. So for example, it's about understanding what is the permeability of the ground? How easily does water move through? Or in terms of thinking about ground source heating or heat networks, understanding the thermal conductivity or thermal diffusivity of the ground. By building up that um, understanding of the properties um, and the link with the different interventions, we can start to understand um, the constraints that we're faced with and the opportunities that are available to us. So um, as an example, again, taking that sort of same subset of towns and cities, here we can see um, a map which shows the susceptibility to groundwater flooding. And we can start to look at which areas within the UK are more or less likely to be affected and which parts of our towns and cities um, uh, are likely to suffer more than others. And we can uh, then open up that dialogue um, about how we plan our cities, um, what is appropriate development, for example. Another constraint, another example here is showing the uh, potential for shrink swell clay, or it's linked to the potential for shrink swell clay under climate change. So where we've got um, geological formations that have a high clay mineral content, um, they're susceptible to changes um, in uh, moisture content. So um, when it's wet, they tend to swell, um, and when uh, they dry out, they shrink. And that um, shrinkage and swelling um, is a particular problem in terms of ground instability, differential settlement, um, causing uh, subsidence or damage to our buildings and our infrastructure, which um, John Chambers has mentioned. And so colleagues um, at BGS who specialise in geohazards, groundwater, and the uh, development of data products have combined our data on the potential for shrink spell clay uh, with the UK CP18 data and our groundwater recharge model to start to look at areas that may be uh, more greatly affected or more susceptible under future climate scenarios. And here we're looking at the regional vari variation uh, for 2030 and 2070. So again, you can see that some parts of the UK are likely to be more affected than others. Of course, it isn't just about constraints. What we want to be able to do is to look at those opportunity areas. Um, and just one example here um, is showing the opportunity to install infiltration sustainable drainage systems or SUDS. Um, and this is where we want to encourage rainwater um, into the ground, reduce surface water runoff and reduce the impacts of flooding. And again, we start to see um, areas more or less affected. But of course, it isn't just about understanding where you can put these um, types of solutions or interventions in place. What we want to be able to do is to understand how well they work as well um, and what additional value or benefits do you get by putting them in. And in doing so, you start to think about these solutions uh, within the integrated urban system. So thinking it not in isolation. And I just want to run through that um, as a scenario with our sustainable drainage systems. So over the last few years, we've had um, a sustainable drainage observatory in Oxfordshire at um, one of the Environment Agency um, offices. And here there is um, a permeable paving car park that's been installed. And what we um, want to do is to contrast the infiltration um, soil moisture and recharge processes between that permeable paving suds and the grassed area adjacent to it. The assumption being that we design suds to um, mimic runoff rates uh, from green areas. So what um, we did at the observatory was to install um, a, a series of soil moisture sensors at two different depths beneath the sud system and beneath the grassed area to contrast the two. And um, these were complemented by some pre-existing uh, groundwater level monitoring wells. I'm not going to go into a huge amount of detail, but just to contrast um, 
the scenario where we had an intense uh, summer rainfall event. So I think it was 30 millimetres over the hour. And what we can see in the um, graphs here is the difference in behaviour um, beneath the sud system and beneath the green area. So the black lines are showing us the um, change in groundwater level and the coloured lines are our soil moisture sensors. And what you observe um, in both locations is a dramatic or uh, very rapid rise in soil moisture content. Uh, in response to that rainfall event. But what you see at the SUD system is that um, it drops off very quickly as well. So what we're seeing here is a very rapid transfer of water through the SUD system, uh, through the soil zone, or bypassing the soil zone really, um, and into the aquifer below. So we're seeing a very rapid rise and drop off. In contrast, what you're seeing um, beneath the grassed area, you're getting that very rapid rise in, in soil moisture, but it's a lot slower um, to uh, decline. And that is because we're seeing the retention of water um, and water storage within that soil zone that we don't necessarily observe within the sud system. So what does that mean in terms of with, um, how we are designing suds or thinking about how we implement suds? Um, so the sub permeable paving is great because it gives you really high infiltration over a, sh a short space of time. It transfers that water um, into the aquifer below. And that's fine if you've got a big space between your sub system and your groundwater level, i.e. your um, unsaturated zone is quite thick. But it, it can be a bit of a problem if you've got shallow water level, groundwater levels or a very um, flashy system because you're not actually delaying or slowing that transfer of water down enough. So um, what we're saying is that um, in some scenarios, the permeable paving is fine, but in other scenarios, you need a hybrid uh, system where you're retaining water as well as infiltrating at the same time. So with an understanding of how these systems um, work, uh, you also want to understand uh, what additional benefits you get by putting them in. Um, and this uh, was a piece of work that was led by business in the community that we were fortunate to be a part of. Um, and our SUDS um, infiltration, or our infiltration SUDS map um, was used to assess where it's possible to put these systems in at schools and NHS sites in Manchester. And that information was combined or integrated with other people's data. So information about flood risk, um, air quality and existing green cover to then um, look at the additional benefits that you might get and um, realizing that it isn't just about um, reducing the impacts of flooding that actually you can create more green space and improve the access for people to go to, um, to, go to these green areas. Um, and also um, they were able to demonstrate um, an improvement in air quality, but over the longer term. So it, just to summarize that really, it's about understanding the ground conditions, about where we can put these systems in, how well they work and how well they fit with the broader questions about our urban areas. Um, and that kind of message was really um, echoed in a piece of work I led for Think Deep UK, um, looking at the social value and the benefits that we get from the urban subsurface space. And it's a good, good point to finish on. And in discussion with the different industry experts that were involved in that, that piece about social value, there were some key messages coming through. Um, and it's about defining the baseline, making sure that we have a good evidence base uh, to make our decisions. Being really mindful about how we're likely to want to use that space into the future um, and being mindful of these new innovations that are coming through. It was recognizing that we have really good technology, really good innovation, and it's about how do we demonstrate that at scale and reduce, uh, improve the confidence in these systems. But perhaps that the um, overriding message that was coming through 
was about this kind of move from just thinking about individual projects and the cost and how they're financed to thinking about these broader um, value, broader benefits um, that you can get when you actually think about the subsurface space in a broader connected um, way that is matched to how our cities function at surface. Um, so just a, a big thank you uh, to some of our partners who've helped um, on this work um, and links to our references and a uh, final plea that if you have any questions, please use the Q&A feature. Um, and at that point, I shall hand you back to John Chambers to wrap up for us. Thank you, Steph. And um, thank you very much indeed for, for all of you dialing in. Thank you for your attention. Now, as Steph said, we're, we're, we're now to, able to take questions um, using the Q&A function. Um, uh, and as said before, if you can address them to specific panel members, uh, that would be really helpful. I know that's slightly complicated by the fact that we've got two Johns um, on, on the panel. Um, now, any questions that we, we, we don't have time to answer today, we will attempt to give written answers after the event. Uh, but what I'll do now, I'll, I'll hand over to my colleague JP from BGS Comms, who is going to read out some of the questions so we can all, all hear them. So, JP. Great. Thanks, John. Well, the good news is we've had quite a few questions coming in as you've been speaking, so I'll, I'll get started with them. Um, Jonathan Mackay, who said the longest to, to recover after his, his talk. Um, and the first question is, how have changes in extraction levels been accounted for in the long term drought data? Yeah, OK, so, um, yeah, I, I probably should have pointed this out, actually, in the talk, which is that, um, that all of those boreholes that we're looking at um, are, are ones that we've chosen specifically because they're not um, significantly impacted by uh, abstractions. So, um, yeah, I, I think that's that's yeah, that's actually one of the challenges we face, which is finding those relatively natural uh, groundwater records that we don't have to. Yeah, so, so so that so that abstraction isn't significantly affecting them. So all of those um, all of those analyses, looking at historical data and also the projection data that I showed you, are all. Uh, focus on boreholes which are significantly affected by um, abstraction. Of course, abstraction is a key, um, yeah, is, 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 is a really important factor uh, when, when thinking about groundwater drought, but for this we're just looking at uh, natural, natural systems. Great, thanks John. Um, we've got another question here, this time for John Chambers. Um, it, does the speed of moving between periods of higher groundwater and near surface water to drought have implications to geohazards? Uh, yeah, that, that's that's a really good question. Um, a lot of the sort of slope stability problems and sort of shrink swell problems that we've we've alluded to and, and, and are, are very very clearly uh, water related. You know, I, I think where where you have the, the, the very rapid sort of saturation of materials you know, and the resultant loss of pore suction, you, you, you can get a very, very quick loss of strength in the material giving rise to, um, to slope failure. So that's, that's significant. Um, and in terms of going between sort of very wet conditions and drought conditions, um, I'd also um, sort of think in terms of sort of fishing, for example, the landslide systems that we look at very often are, are fissured due to a combination of clay shrink swell in very dry periods, as, as well as um, the, the movement of the landslide. And, and where you, you're going from maybe a very dry period with a significant development of fissures, um, then a period of intense rain, you effectively get short circuiting of moisture to, to deeper levels um, within the landslide, uh, which, which is, is clearly a, a potential um, sort of problem in terms of slope stability. And then, if you like, cycling in general between um, sort of elevated water levels, very wet conditions versus, versus drought. I mean, you, I think you, I mean, one, one model of um, sort of slope failure, so something that the Achilles project I've mentioned in particular is looking at, sort of progressive sort of cyclic um, deterioration in strength over, over time, um, uh, which, you know, as, as we move to a greater frequency of extreme wet and dry, uh, will surely exacerbate those sorts of, um, of processes. So just a, a few thoughts there. 
That's great. Thanks, John. Um, okay, another question this time for Stephanie. Um, how does groundwater move around buried infrastructure? Constructing a tunnel through a fairly secure subsurface may create a potential route for groundwater to follow more rapidly than normal. Can this be modelled? Yeah, that's a really um, important consideration. Um, and it's actually not just um, sort of buried pipes as well. We have to consider the impacts of basements um, on groundwater flow in shallowed environments. Um, and, you know, I should probably actually point out the um, National Underground Asset Register, which is hoping to map the locations of some of these um, pipes um, and buried utilities so that we can get a better handle of it. On it, so there is, a, you know, there's a couple of issues. There's one um, about whether these pipes are creating conduits um, for groundwater flow, which um, is is a problem, um, and also whether you're getting the ingress of groundwater into these buried systems. Again, that needs to be taken into account um, when it's modelled. So yes, um, it is the sort of thing that can be modelled, modelled, but you do need to know where these infrastructure are, the likely density. Um, and you also importantly uh, need to know your shallow groundwater conditions and sometimes within the urban setting that's very difficult to get a handle on um, because of the variability and in infiltration, leakage from pipes, etc. Thanks Stephanie. Um, okay, another question for John Mackay. I think this is related to one of your graphs right at the start of your talk, John. And it's asking, is the borehole distribution sufficient to monitor are there surface geophysical approaches to fill the gaps? Um, so is, this, is the borehole distribution sufficient to monitor? Uh, I, well, my answer to that is always no. We always need more data and we always want more data. So, um, yeah, I guess um, I, I actually going back to the, the point before about groundwater abstraction, one of the things we really struggle with is finding those, those locations where they're relatively natural. Um, so it, it's really important we have that because we want to take out the, the impact of abstraction. So, um, you know, in an ideal world, we wouldn't have any abstraction and we just have a natural system that we can, that, you know, that, that we can work with. But um, I, I think that's probably more of an issue necessarily than not having enough uh, boreholes to, to, to use to monitor. Um, and that's really where, that, I mean, that's, that's really where, where modelling actually comes in. Um, so geophysical approaches could be a way of potentially filling in the gaps. I think I'd probably actually pass, pass the buck on to John James to talk a little bit about that if, if he wanted to. But I, I would say that modeling has a, has a really important role to play there in terms of filling the gaps and that it allows us to extend beyond our observations than actually, you know, go into regions where we don't, where we don't have the observation data. So, um, so yeah, it's, it, it is, it is tricky. It's, you know, we've got to work with the with the data we have, and unfortunately, abstraction is a is a big issue. That's kind of the, the key reason we we don't have we're not looking at boreholes everywhere. Um, yeah, so I, I don't know, John, if if you'd like to comment on the geophysical, then please feel free to. Yeah, yeah, I I, I can comment on that, I mean, and I think the short answer is is, is yes. Uh, surface geophysics or, or cross borehole geophysics um, can. Can have a role to play in this. Uh, I'm, I'm slightly biased, um, being sort of a geoelectrical um, specialist, but, but given the sensitivity of, of resistivity, for example, to, to changing moisture conditions, um, it provides a, a good basis on, on, to, on which to use those sorts of approaches to sort of spatially image um, uh, groundwater levels, for example, um, uh, unsaturated zone processes as well, um, to, to complement, and I'd, I'd stress complement. Um, borehole based approaches. I mean, there's always a trade off. Okay, the, um, you know, in terms of spatial coverage, uh, geophysics um, might, might help significantly, particularly in heterogeneous environments, but it's an indirect approach with, with greater uncertainty associated with, with the observations. Great, thanks both. Um, John, this, uh, sorry, Jonathan Chambers, um, a question here for you. How well do the sensor arrays withstand landslides themselves if when they occur? For long-term monitoring of sites with frequent landslides, is this a problem? And if so, how do you plan for it? It is certainly a problem. Uh, the the geoelectrical and, and, and fibre optic uh, techniques that I've, I've mentioned are vulnerable uh, 
uh, to being ripped apart when when the ground when the ground moves. So, so how how do we deal with this? Well, there, there's a, there's a, f a few thoughts here. So the, the Holland Hill example I, I, I gave you, the the arrays are installed in in sections, uh, not one long continuous line, uh, with the thinking that if one section goes due to to uh, movement somewhere on the site, then we don't have to replace the whole whole array. Uh, we've built slack into the system um, so that the uh, arrays can accommodate um, significant movement in fact before they before they break and if, if i think we, we installed the the early early systems um, at holland hill the resistivity based systems back in 2008 um, we've had to replace one or two sections on one or two occasions and that's despite the landslide in areas having moved more than five meters you know in terms of displacement uh, another another reflection, and, and particularly as a researcher, perhaps that I'm I'm really open, I'm really happy, you know, <laughs> to to deal with with broken arrays. Um, if we can capture, you know, um, landslide events and the precursor processes uh, building up to it, you know, in in order for us to better understand, better calibrate our, our techniques. So, so so yes, I, I hope that's that's gone some way to, to answering that, that question. Great, thanks, thanks, John. Um, a question for Stephanie this time: What are the implications of the changing climate for proposed surf subsurface energy storage projects, such as the CAES, compressed air energy storage, or gravity storage? Great question. Um, I'll admit it's not an area that I I work on actively, so I think that's probably a question we'll take back to our colleagues, but. I do think we need to be really mindful of the fact that we are seeing, you know, a lot of um, different and novel uses of subsurface space. And we're really aware about um, the potential conflicts between those different uses and protecting the use of subsurface space for more strategic kind of um, public good activities. Um, which, you know, is something that's really important in terms of having that coordinated subsurface planning. I think in terms of looking at the impacts of specific um, projects, we probably need to be doing better in terms of collecting baseline data to understand the full impacts of um, different uses. So things like having uh, good information about uh, the geotechnical properties, groundwater levels, um, temperature sensors, for example. But yeah, let's take take that question away and get some more detail about the specifics of energy storage. Great, thanks, Stephanie. This is probably a good point to point out that a recording of this presentation will be available in the coming days. And any questions we don't have time, we will put in a document PDF format alongside that recording. So, and that includes answers that we're not able to fully give because um, it may require input from colleagues. Um, so another question here for uh, Jonathan Mackay. Um, are there any correlations between flooding events and the ending of drought periods? Do drought periods potentially drive increased flooding impacts when it starts to rain? Could we suggest that flooding is made worse after drought periods? Yeah, in fact, I think I, I was just um, having a quick browse. I believe there is a study that's recently come out about this, but I couldn't find it in time. So, um, yeah, I, I, th I think we can say that. Um, it's known that after prolonged uh, dry, hot periods, um, the ground surface effectively becomes, well, I think the technical term is baked um, and, and effectively less permeable. So what you can find is you get these long, hot dry periods followed by, and if that's followed by intense or relatively intense rainfall, then you can get, um, because of that reduced permeability, you're then getting an increased risk of, of surface water flooding. Um, so certainly for surface water flooding, I think, yes. Uh, in terms of groundwater flooding, you would argue that, well, actually it could be the opposite because you're kind of reducing the, the surface permeability and therefore you're reducing the potential recharge um, to the subsurface. But yeah, that my 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 overall answer is yes. I think you could say there there is some association between that. I'd, I'd be I'd quite like to follow that up actually with a couple of pointers to relevant literature on that. But um, yeah, really interesting question. Uh, a very short question here for you, uh, John Chambers, um, and it says: Trees, good or bad for hydrogeology and slope stability? Um, yeah, I I don't know. I. I... Um, 
be very tentative um, in, in any response I give here. And the short answer is I, I don't know. Um, but going back to the example that I provided um, of the, the railway cutting um, and the contrast between the moisture dynamics in the grassed area versus the, the wooded area, we, we do see a, a very, very substantial difference. Um, and if, if your view is, is that, you know, to maintain a steadier or consistent moisture content distribution, then, then, then perhaps the, the, the grassed area um, um, has, has some advantages to it. But it's, I, I know it's a, it's, a, it's a very, very hot topic of debate with, um, with um, some of our, our bigger asset owners who, who have to deal with, with, with these issues. Yeah. Yeah, a simple question, a very complicated answer. So, uh, yeah, probably good to leave it there. Um, okay, another question for Steph. Um, do you have any thoughts about how we could go about ensuring that broader benefits can actually be considered rather than just individual projects? Would this have to come through the planning regime? Yeah, that's a really, um, yeah, really interesting point. And actually, the we have the... Um, social value act in the uk which is trying to encourage um the kind of broader environmental social uh benefits that you derive from projects and what you see is that implemented across large um schemes and as part of that process what they're trying to do is to encourage dialogue in at very early stages amongst the communities that are going to be affected um, so it gives um, a really good opportunity to bring together the um, different stakeholders, the local community, um, as part of that conversation. Um, and I think as geologists, as um, environment, you know, experts in the environment, uh, we need to make sure that our information and evidence is available at that stage um, and that it's well communicated um, so that we can start to have these um, kind of broader discussions about value and benefits in the longer term, rather than just sort of looking at an individual project with defined um, physical boundaries. Thanks, Stephanie. Um, okay, another question for Jonathan Mackay. Is the SGI work on drought prediction being done elsewhere, where impact of climate change may be more problematic than the UK or Ireland, where I've also seen this done recently? Yeah, so yeah, the answer is yes, it is being done elsewhere. Um, so admittedly, it, it, I mean, it is still uh, a relatively new area of research, I guess. So, so admittedly, a lot of the work that we've done so far is focused um, on the UK. But there is, I, I would actually point the, um, the, the person that asked that question, if they search for the European Groundwater Drought Initiative, um, that is a wider sort of drought analysis, drought initiative, which is looking, which is getting groundwater level data across across Europe. Um, so uh, yeah, so so the idea is bringing in lots and lots of lots of groundwater level data across across the European countries, and then using the SGI to look at spatial coherence and temporal coherence of, of groundwater drought across yeah across there. Um, beyond Europe. Uh, I don't want to say no because there might be someone doing that at the moment, but at the, but as far as I'm aware, I think it's I think it's UK and Europe. But there could there could be some additional work that I'm not actually aware of at the moment. Great. Thanks, John. Um, okay, question for Jonathan Chambers this time. Um, given climate change, why are we not more proactive in obtaining baseline laser scan data for the UK coast, especially in soft rock or areas of superficial deposits? Uh, I, I should say up front that I'm not a coastal specialist and I'm not a LIDAR specialist um, either. Um, so I'll, I'll, again, I'll, I'll limit my response there. Um, but I, 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 I certainly appreciate the, the, the thrust of the question in, in that, you know, the, the coastal zone is, is of, of critical importance, particularly when considering um, rising sea levels. I suppose um, what, what I've come to appreciate um, with, with my work in terms of infrastructure uh, including engagement uh, with, with people responsible for, for looking at flood defences and the like. It's just the, the considerable resource that there's already there in, in terms of airborne LIDAR covering very significant portions of, um, of the UK. Uh, I'm not in a position to comment on whether or not 
um, you know, we've got a particular lack of it within the coastal area, but, but certainly um, for certain infrastructures and in certain areas, the, the holdings are, are remarkably good. Thanks, Jonathan. Um, okay, question for Jonathan Mackay. Um, do you see there being a need to significantly reduce the amount of the abstraction in the future? Oh. Uh, yeah, that's a tricky one. <laughs> um, yeah, I guess, uh, I mean, actually, I, so I'm, I'm not sure, to be honest, I'm not certain. Um, but I would kind of play devil's advocate and say there might be an argument to, to argue the opposite, that actually we should be increasing, we might need to increase groundwater uh, abstraction in the future. Um, and the reason for that being that groundwater is um, uh, a relatively slowly responding water store compared to surface water stores, so whether they're reservoirs or, or rivers or whatever. So they tend to act as a kind of... Um, a sort of buffer system. So if, if so, if we don't have access to surface water, uh, then we generally will still have access to groundwater because it's a much more slowly responding system. So during times of surface water drought, groundwater can actually play a role as as a more important water source. So you, you could say that if uh, under climate change, if surface water drought is projected to get worse, then maybe groundwater actually uh, plays a more important role. Um, so the my answer is I don't know. But um, I just want to put that out there as a as a as a as food for thought. Really, I don't think it's necessarily a case of abstracting less. Um, it, it could actually be the other way around. Thanks, John. Uh, okay, a question for Stephanie. Um, you mentioned the importance of having baseline data to assess urban subsurface use. What data should we be collecting? Yeah, it's really important um, within our urban areas. Uh, that kind of zone of engineering or, or construction is, is quite the shallow zone. Um, and in terms of geology, if we think about the scales at which we monitor, we tend, we tend to have less information um, about that, that top zone. Um, so there is a real need to uh, collect more baseline data about what is in the ground in terms of the, the physical structures. Um, and we are making some headway with that. I know the Geospatial Commission are looking at um, the establishment of the, uh, the National Underground Asset Register. Um, but in terms of uh, the geology, things like um, understanding ground temperatures, understanding very shallow groundwater levels, looking at um, levels of infiltration uh, or infiltration rates so we can get a better handle on urban recharge, I think is an important area. Um, and actually, I think as a science community, thinking about how we can um, uh, better sense uh, or have sensors um, in that space. So could we make better use of embedded sensors on infrastructure, on, on buildings to help us with that? Or are there opportunities um, for citizen science to gather um, more data on our behalf? Um, and actually, I should say, you know, that the, um, the private sector, geotechnical consultants, geoenvironmental consultants are collecting a lot of data themselves. So sometimes it's actually just about uh, better reuse or better collation um, of that data so that we have um, a better asset or evidence base uh, for everybody to make use of. Thanks, Stephanie. Um, okay, a question for Jonathan Chambers here. Um, what are the costs associated with setting up landslide early warning systems? Um, going to vary dramatically depending on the nature of the early warning system. Uh, as I've indicated, you know, there, there are lots of different approaches, lots of different sensing types, um, and, and lots of different scales. Um, so, so it's a, it's a very, very difficult question uh, to answer. There's, there's the cost of in situ instrumentation, the cost of remote sensing, um, data acquisition um, also. And then there's a cost of processing and, and managing the, um, the, the results. So, so for an early warning system, and um, clearly the, if you like, processing side, the software side is critical um, to, to the success of any system. So the delivery of any information in, in a timely fashion the reduction of you know, false alarms, for example, the cost of false alarms 
uh, can be very significant in its own right. So, so, so far, I, I haven't answered the question, but I, what I would say is, is that it's, it, it varies a lot. And, and clearly the research that we're doing is seeking to develop ways of, of reducing costs by novel low cost instrumentation, by automating more and more, if you like, the processes that, that we, we use to, uh, to interrogate and, and serve up the data. Um, so, so yeah, that, that's probably a slightly long way of, of not really answering the question, but, but I suppose highlighting the, the complexities involved in it. That was expertly done. John. Um, okay, thank you. So a question here for Jonathan Mackay. Is there an understanding of how old mine workings interact with groundwater and aquifer levels? Yes, um, but I'm probably not the person to answer this. <laughs> so, um, I, I, yeah, there is. I'm actually, I, I'd like to, uh, I, I think I'd like to um, uh, uh, consult my colleagues on that and actually provide a more definitive answer um, as a sort of follow up to this. So yeah, there is, this isn't something that I that I actually personally work on very much, but I know there are others that do. So um, yes, yeah, so I'll happily uh, 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 follow that up with some, with a more detailed uh, answer. Okay, thanks John. I mean. I'm just looking at the number of questions. It is great. There's obviously a lot of um, interest in these great presentations that the three of you have just given. I don't think we're going to have time to answer all of them today. So there is one last one that I'll probably open up to all three of you. Um, and that came in um, uh, about 10 minutes ago. And that is, how are you communicating the results of your research so the public can understand the implications? I don't know, Jonathan Chambers, start with your, yourself. Uh, I... Yeah, that, that, that's a good question. And um, um, what to make of it? Um, I think events such as this um, are, are, are a key part of it uh, for a start. Um, it, it's been, a, I suppose, a, a challenge that I've, I've experienced um, uh, throughout, throughout my career. My, 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 my work has been very much focused on making sort of geophysical solutions available to stakeholders. So, so overcoming barriers in terms of lack of familiarity have, have always been an issue. Um, you know, with geophysics, I've, I've often looked to the, the medical analogy, you know, sort of likening sort of geophysical imaging work due to the sort of more familiar medical imaging work, you know, in terms of non-invasive imaging of complex processes and structures, to, you know, to help people gain, gain a better understanding. Uh, and then in terms of working with, with specialists, you know, within computer vision, for example, and, uh, working with geotechnical specialists who are used to serving up um, ge geotechnical information to, to end users and stakeholders um, and, and, and seeking to develop similar processes with, with our sort of geophysical um, information. But yeah, I'll, I'll hand over to the other guys now, just, just some thoughts there. Shall I, um, shall I take that one? Yeah, similar to John, I think we we probably actually communicate more with local planners um, and and uh, those working in the kind of construction sector. But communication to the public is really important. And I think one of the um, nicest examples that I've had the opportunity to work on was uh, a piece of work which was done with um, what is now the Connected Places catapult, where we had um, a gaming model set up as an exhibition and it allowed people to physically run out different future scenarios of what they would like London to look like um, in the near future. Um, and that was quite nice. It's a, it's a way of getting people to actually make decisions and see uh, the implications of, of their decisions played out in what their future city might look like. That was a wonderful um, project to be involved with. Um, and perhaps another example, um, my colleagues who are working on the Camellia uh, project which is about community water management in London and they're actively working with the local communities to think about how sustainable drainage systems can be put in place so actually bringing them um, into the project um, and that's a project that's led by um, Imperial College so yeah a couple of nice examples. Yeah, I, I, I think I'm, yeah, in general agreement with uh, Stefan um, and John's comments. Yeah, it is, it, it's, you know, it's events like this um, 
there's I mean, there's lots of things that we that we're kind of getting involved in. So, you know, BGS um, uh, open days that we have, which is where we kind of invite members of the public onto site uh, and they can see, you know, all the kind of work that we do. Um, our, our, our comms, so we have a sort of a, a comms team at BGS that are really good at kind of encouraging us to put out blogs and, and public lectures and things like this as well, um, which is yeah, a really nice way of, of kind of communi communicating with the public. But um, yeah, I think it's, it is, um, yeah, it's something that we're still, I think we're still getting better at and it's something we probably in the past haven't done enough of, um, but I think we're definitely on the sort of right trajectory to doing more of it. Just to give you an example of, of one thing um, that we've done, which is related to one of the slides I showed you, if you remember, um, I had a, a slide of our groundwater model Aquamod, um, which is kind of like a series of buckets. Um, so our hydrogeology team created an actual physical Aquamod model, which is a series of buckets filled with water and you can you can watch it going through the various zones and it's kind of a physical representation of, of the model that you can actually play with. Um, so that's a really good way of getting, you know, particularly kids um, uh, involved and sort of, you know, engaging them with the science. So. I think yeah, it needs um, it needs a lot of sort of thinking outside, thinking outside the box, and um, yeah, um, I guess coming away from desks and actually going out there and, and talking about things. So, yeah. Well, oh, thanks, John. Thanks, Steph. And as um, JP has indicated, our, our time has gone now. Um, now, thank you again to my co-presenters uh, and, and to JP for, for setting the event up. And thank you all for, for dialing in and for listening and, and for your, your excellent questions. I really do appreciate that. And, um, and, and of course, as we've said, this, this will be made available uh, after the event uh, online, along with answers to the questions that you have asked. So, so thank you very much again.